Okay, we're going to go to Luke chapter 4, um, and this is the third attempt on Jesus Christ's life in the Gospels. And um, it's not a long one, but we've, we've got a few records we're going to look at tonight, a bunch of different ones. So Luke chapter 4, verse 14, it says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. This is, you know, after he had been tempted in the wilderness. That's what we looked at last week. And um, so he returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went in to the synagogue, into the synagogue, on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. Now, we believe that Jesus Christ um, was baptized and started his ministry when he was 30 years old. So, he, it would seem that he lived in Nazareth, you know, a great part of his life. So, it's not like he's going to a strange place where these people didn't know him. Uh, these were his neighbors, his friends, his, I don't know, maybe even some relatives. Who knows? <clears throat> and so he stood up, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written or where it was written, the spirit of the law, Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So <clears throat> Jesus Christ taught that when it says, uh, that the, that the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, and because he anointed me, that, that, that points out that this was one of the purposes of his ministry in life. You know, this is one of the things he was appointed to do. So, and that was to preach the gospel to the poor, uh, heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recover the sight of the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. So, um, you know, that's a pretty shocking thing. He's telling those people what? That... He is the fulfillment of this prophecy, right? That's what he's telling them. <clears throat> and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Well, was he? No, no he wasn't Joseph's son. He was the son of God. But in their village, who had raised him as his father? Joseph. And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when heaven was shut up, three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. And Elias means Elijah, and that's when he was hiding from Ahab, and he, and he prophesied that there would be a drought and a famine for three years and six months. And that's what happened. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And, and that was, you know, 
Sidon was uh, a place of unbelievers. It was Gentiles. And many lepers were in Israel the time of Elias or Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. So, you know, the, the Jews didn't get healed, the lepers in the Jewish community. Um, but Naaman, who was a Syrian, another Gentile. And all they heard, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They were enraged and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of a hill where on their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. So they thrust him out of the synagogue, which, what do they mean? They bodily threw him out of the synagogue, physically threw him out of the synagogue. These were people that he grew up with. These were people that knew him. And they were so enraged at what he said that they threw him out and they wanted to kill him. <clears throat> Where on the city, we, okay. And they rose up, thrust him out of the sea, and led him up on the brow of a hill, which is like a cliff, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. <coughs> Excuse me? Ah. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. So in the city where he grew up, where people knew him, where they had watched him grow up as a boy, as they had um, known him, they were enraged at his teaching. But then in Capernaum, they were astonished. They were amazed at his teaching. And they appreciated it. So. <clears throat> Uh, it's pretty amazing the way people react to the word. Um, we're going to see that he wasn't well re received or uh, well liked in Judea, but he also wasn't well liked in Nazareth. So that's pretty crazy. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. So that was the... the the attempt on his life. And then in Mark chapter 1, verse 21, we begin. And it says, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. Now this is, you know, probably a week or so after the attempt to kill him in Nazareth, according to... Uh, Walter Cummins' book on uh, the acceptable year of the Lord. <clears throat> I could go through all uh, you know, the details and stuff of how he figures that out, but I'm just, that's what he said. It's about a week, probably a week after the attempt on his life in Nazareth. Um, he would have traveled to Capernaum, which wouldn't have taken that long, but he, he, you know, it was the Sabbath day when he taught in Nazareth, and, and so probably was the next Sabbath. Um, verse 22, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now, it's kind of interesting. It says in verse 23, the man had an unclean spirit, but when the spirit speaks, not the man, but the spirit takes control of his uh, vocal cords and, and speaks, and he says, us. And I don't know if there was more than one spirit in the man, or maybe he's just being representative of, um, you know, other devil spirits that he knew around. He said, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee. Thou art the Holy One of God. Um, <clears throat> so who's in charge of 
unclean spirits? The devil, right. And the devil is the one that wants to get rid of Jesus Christ. Verse 25, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. He didn't hold a conversation with the spirit. He didn't allow him to speak. He rebuked him and commanded him to come out. You know, it was, it was quick, it was sharp, it was to the point, and he did it with authority. Verse 26, and when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread th abroad throughout all the region, round about Galilee. So <clears throat> there's a parallel record here. We're going to go back to Luke 4 and see what it says there. Um, but Jesus Christ is teaching... He's teaching in the synagogue, and all of a sudden, this, this unclean spirit interrupts, speaks up. Why would he do that? Stop the word from being taught. Yeah, he stopped the word from being taught to embarrass Jesus Christ, challenging him, saying, you know, here I am. Are you going to hurt us? Are you going to destroy us? Luke chapter 4, verse 31. Uh, this is after, you know, he, he, was, he was thrown out of, of Nazareth, and it says he came down to Capernaum. We read that, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. Now this gives us a little more specific information. In, the, in Mark, he called it an unclean spirit. Here it calls the spirit of an unclean devil. So it's a, you know, it's a devil spirit. Saying, verse 34, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, thou art who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus re rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went into every place of the country round about. So we see both records, and they agree with one another. Um, if we were to go further down in these records, we would see that Jesus Christ continued to teach, and there was great deliverance, many healings. Uh, but the interesting thing is, again, here in Capernaum, it was on the Sabbath day, and he wasn't challenged by the Pharisees or the Sadducees. He wasn't challenged by uh, people that were outraged or offended, but rather the devil spirit tried to stop him on the Sabbath day. So, and they were all amazed. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 5. Now, this is a little different. This is is not uh, as antagonistic, but uh, it points up that Jesus Christ was very sharp with the word. And any time anybody um, would question his understanding or his authority, he would, he would take a stand. So, <clears throat> so he, he's walking by and he sees... Uh, Peter and his brother, Andrew and John and James, and they're, you know, fixing their nets because they're fishermen. And when they, it says in verse 11, when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him, followed Jesus Christ. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, Thou canst make me whole. 
Oh, I started in the wrong place. Let's go back to verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake Genesaret, or Genesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking unto Simon, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets, plural, for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and we have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net, singular. Well, what's Peter saying? Well, you know, you're teaching the word of God, but I'm the fisherman. You know, but who invented everything? God. And who walked with God and who heard and listened to God? And Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So, so Peter, very early on in his time as a disciple and then a an apostle, I believe this is the first record of him challenging Jesus Christ to what Jesus Christ said. You know, it's just, it's a challenge. And he, he says, he says I'll, I'll do it, but you don't know what you're talking about. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. When Peter, Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was, you know, James and John and all those other guys. Let's go back to Mark chapter 2. So that's just the first time his disciples challenged him. That's not the last time, but it was the first time. Chapter 2, verse 1. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And Jesus Christ apparently had moved to Capernaum. He had, he had a place to stay there. And he came back to Capernaum after he had traveled around. He was teaching in other villages and stuff throughout Galilee, it says in verse 1. And he was back in the house. And this is after the time we had read when he had come and he had cast out the devil spirit in the man who had the uh, unclean spirit, right, in the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath day. And then it talks about how he had healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And then many others came later on in the evening, and he healed many that were sick and cast out spirits and so on. And so then here it says, he came back to Capernaum, and the people heard that he was home. He came back. So they were excited, and straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. So whatever this house was or wherever he was, they came and they packed the place so that you couldn't even get in the doors. And he was teaching the word. And they came or they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So these four guys have this friend who has the palsy, meaning he is um, infirm, he's crippled, and he can't walk, and they're carrying him carrying him to Jesus Christ. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. So, now they didn't, um, they didn't break up the guy's roof, but rather in the, in the east, the houses all have flat, or most of the houses have flat roofs. And 
because they cooked inside, a lot of times they would have a, a hole in the roof that they would open up so that smoke could get out, and then they would cover it up with some kind of panel or something. So in this case, apparently they removed the panel and they let the man down. Um, <clears throat> they let the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, their believing, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sin sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? So what are these guys doing? They're accusing Jesus Christ in their hearts that he's a blasphemer, that he's blaspheming God, that he's saying bad things. Um, who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? How did he know? Revelation. Yeah, by revelation. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom. And then God told them to speak up. Because eventually they would have said something, I'm sure. They would have said something. They would have... <clears throat> So he says, why reason, reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether, it is, whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And then there's a parenthesis, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. Hmm. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, or, yeah, God, saying, We never saw it on such fashion. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. So again, you know, they, they were offended. They were offended that he healed somebody. He was offended. They were offended that he said that his sins were forgiven. The scribes uh, didn't speak out, but God revealed it to Jesus Christ, what they were thinking. Um, there's a parallel record. We're not going to look at it, but in Luke 5, 7 through 26, if you want to look at it, it's the same record or a parallel record to Mark concerning this. Now let's go back to Mark 2, or continue in Mark 2, verse 23. <clears throat> and it came to pass he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began, as they went, to pluck the ears of corn. Okay, corn in, the, in biblical times is not what we think of as corn. There was no, uh, you know, it's not maize or yellow corn or the type of corn that we know of. It was wheat or barley or some kind of grain. That's what they considered corn. Um, <clears throat> So they, they were going through the fields, which was legal to do because after the harvest, people would leave behind enough for people that had need or were hungry that they could take what was left. It was part of their culture and the way they did things. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? My question really to me is, why are the Pharisees out there in the cornfield watching him? I, mean, I was just thinking that. You know, were they following him to see if they could find something wrong? And he said unto them, have ye never read that David, what David did? When he had need, he was in hungered, he and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, 
the high priest and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests and gave also to them which were with him. The house of God at this time would have been uh, the tabernacle because the, the temple wasn't built yet, right? Mm -hmm. So the tabernacle and the tabernacle, if you've ever seen a picture or a rendition of what the tabernacle looked like, it was a tent and it had a courtyard which was enclosed with a cloth wall held up by stakes and there was an entrance they go in and then down at the other end there was the tent and there was an opening and the first enclosure or room that you would walk into would be called the holy place where the candlesticks were and the table and and they were they would put on the table, they would put the showbread, which was, you know, some kind of cake that they made with oil and, and flour and so forth. And it was for the priests. <clears throat> so David and his companions at some point in time went into the holy place, and, which was only for priests, and they took the showbread and ate it. Now... He, he points to David because why? David was revered among all Israelites. He was the great king and the great prophet who wrote Psalms and, and did great exploits and, and made Israel a great country. So when he says that, you know, they have to think, right? Oh, David did that. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made, was made for man and not the man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So, you know, <clears throat> see here again, the Pharisees, they're always trying to discredit Jesus Christ and his followers. They were always trying to find something to pick at, to point to, to, to discredit him, to, to criticize him. And in this case, it was because they were eating food out in the fields. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Chapter 12 of Matthew, in verse 1. <clears throat> and this is a parallel record again. And at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Now, you know, they considered lots of things, the Pharisees, and, and, and they made up a lot of stuff. So, you know, it said that you were supposed to rest on the Sabbath day. So one of the things that they made up was, you know, remember the Sabbath day's journey? They, they said you can only walk a certain amount of steps on the Sabbath day, and if you walked any more than that number of steps, you were sinning because you were working. You know, and that, you don't see that in Leviticus or Deuteronomy. It's not there. But can you imagine counting your steps? I mean, we count our steps to see if we're getting enough exercise in or something, but we don't count our steps to worry about sinning. <clears throat> But he said unto them, have you not read? Now, remember when he answered the devil and the devil questioned him, he said, it is written. Well, here he doesn't say it is written, but he says, have you not read? What's he talking about? The word, right? Haven't you read the scriptures? Have you not read? <clears throat> what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath day. So he let them have it, didn't he? He said, 
I'm the Lord of the Sabbath day. That's something. They didn't know what to do with that. But again, you know, he went to the word. His, his, his response was the word of God. Let's read on chapter 12, verse 9. And he went, and when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. Now, the word synagogue, we've read that several times. We're going to read it a lot more in the Gospels. And it's kind of interesting. The Hebrew equivalent is the word Gnesset. And it means a gathering of any persons or things for any purpose. That's kind of similar to what the word church means, right? Mm -hmm. Ecclesia. Right? Yeah, ecclesia in Greek. It means, you know, uh, people called out for a purpose or to meet, to gather. Interestingly, today in Israel, uh, the parliament is called the Gnesset. The That's what it's called. So, uh, and the, the Greek word for synagogue is synagogue. S-Y-N-A-G-O-G-E. So it's just transliterated over into English. And it is used in the Old Testament for the assembly of Israel. In the Gospel period um, and on, it also refers to the buildings in which they met. So just like the word church, you know, the church originally was about the gathering or the meeting of people, but then later on, the place where they met was also titled the church. So this is kind of interesting. Okay, <clears throat> I just thought I'd throw that out there for you. So when he was departed he, thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? That they might accuse him. You know, pretty amazing. Behold, the word behold is always used to get our attention, and it's in the imperative. And they asked him, who's they? They asked Jesus Christ. And the purpose of the question was not because they wanted to learn something. The purpose of the question uh, was not so that they could, uh, you know, gain wisdom or learn, but it was so that they might accuse him. It's not really the right reason to ask a question, is it? <laughs> no. <clears throat> and he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Um, so they wanted to accuse him. Uh, I wanted to read something in Romans about accusing. So let's go back to verse 10 there. It says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And the word accuse is, is a word that means to speak against before judges. So it means to accuse. And if you hold your place here and go to Romans chapter 2, there's an interesting little section. <clears throat> and we're beginning in verse 13 of chapter 2. It says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing else or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called the Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast to God 
and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For the circumcision, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, to, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision thus transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So let's go back to Matthew. So, you know, when you look at the Pharisees and the things they said and what they did, uh, that pretty much uh, describes it. You know, they, they, they pretended to be the teachers of the law and that you shouldn't steal, but they stole. And they did all the things that they told other people not to do. Um, so they accused Jesus Christ. Um, but Jesus Christ saw these religionists for what they were. Uh, Another place I want you to look real quick is in Revelation, chapter 12. Because who is the great accuser? Yeah, that's right. So in verse 7, it says, chapter 12, verse 7, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought against his angels. You know, the word dragon is a, not a good translation. It just means a large serpent. It's the same basic word for serpent. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, and the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. He's the great accuser. And so back in, in Matthew, when they accused him, you know, it was the devil that was, or Satan that was manipulating the things. Uh, we looked at that, you know, Satan indirectly causing the problems. And so verse 11 again, he said unto them, What man shall there be that shall have one sheep? And if he fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much better than, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. And the word well is a really cool word, too. It's... Uh, it means to be beautiful or excellent or proper. Um, <clears throat> it's the word kalos, K-A-L-O-S, not callous, but kalos. Uh, it means good or beautiful or suitable. 
Um, so it's a, it's a really good word. It's also translated good. You do good. You do well. So <clears throat> how much then... How much then is a man better than sheep? Where, for it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. It is, there's nothing wrong with doing what's right or good or proper on the Sabbath days. Then said he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and he was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him, how they might, what? Destroy him. So it wasn't, it wasn't a threat to his life necessarily, but they took counsel. They were thinking, okay, how are we going to get him? How are we going to trick him? How are we going to condemn him? What can we do to screw him up? Let's go to Mark 3. Mark 3, see this record again. Um, in verse 1, it says, And he entered again into the synagogue. We, we looked at what a synagogue was. And there was a man which had a withered hand. And of course, a withered hand, the word withered means dried up. That's technically or literally what it means, a dried up hand basically a dead hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he said unto them, it is lawful to do good. And that word good is the word well, same word, kalos, meaning, you know, proper, excellent, beautiful. Is it is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he looked round about on them with what? Anger. 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 Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. You know, the first place that we ever see the hardness of hearts really expressed is when Moses, when God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh. And he goes those many times, and each time, you know, he says, now you're going to go, you're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, and then Pharaoh will harden his heart, or God says, I will harden his heart, and, and he won't let him go, and then you'll go back, and then this will happen, and he turns the water into blood. He sends the frogs and the flies and the this, uh, <coughs> dust and whatever else there were, all those different things, grasshoppers, all that stuff. See, and, and the hardness of the heart simply is, the hardness of the heart is refusing God's word. You know, when, when you turn your back on God's word, when you refuse to, to have a heart for God's word and, and, and do what God wants you to do, that's hardness of heart. And with anger, because it was God's desire for this man to be healed, right? This, God didn't want him to be sick, and, and Jesus Christ was there speaking the word. They knew he had healed people before. <clears throat> he looked round about on them with anger, being grieved at the hardness of their hearts. He saith unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Again, they, they went out to take counsel, to plot, to conspire, how they might kill him. And then in Luke chapter 6, is the last place where this is covered, in verse 6, it says, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man with the right hand, whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who, which had the withered hand, Rise up, stand forth in the midst. And he rose up and stood forth. Then Jesus said unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? 
And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. <coughs> and they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. So again, you know, they conspired. Um, they, the they of Mark and, and Matthew were the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, all three agree on one thing. The scribes and Pharisees were interested in one thing, catching Jesus Christ and breaking the law so that they could accuse him. But Jesus Christ, knowing the scriptures and obeying his father God, handled the situation perfectly, and the man with the withered hand was healed and made whole. You know, and that's the way he did it. Every time he sought to do something good, it seems like, they got offended. And, and a lot of times it happened in the synagogues and it happened on the Sabbath day. And, and, but they were always looking continually to try to catch him, to accuse him, to ensnare him, uh, and, and conspiring in some way that they might destroy him. So that's where we're going to stop tonight. And then next week, we'll continue on with the trials and uh, tribulations. What did we say? Trials and, tribulations. trials and tribulations of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. There's a lot, lot more. It's going to take a little while. But it's kind of fun to see it. And you see how many times, no matter what he did, no matter how much he healed people and helped people and did miracles, that the devil would just... Uh, manipulate people to stand against him, to try to hurt him, to try to stop him. So, Father God, we thank you for this night. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and how he was so strong, how he was so willing to obey you, and how he always listened and, and carried out your will and pleased you. And he didn't care about what the people thought. He didn't care what they said. He just did what you told him to do. So we thank you for that, God. We thank you for how he was a, a marvelous example to us to stand upon your word. And we thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.